training videos to complement this that you'll be able eventually to just drop in on a specific thing if you want to learn about it. But we thought we would get this going first um, to get you all on board, and then we're happy to support you as you go out in the field and uh, do this tree inventory work. All you're going to need for the inventory work um, is this, which is a measuring tape. You might not see it because my background is on. Um, I have a whole box of them here. Um, and if you want one, um, Michael at the end or at any time actually um, will be able to collect your information. And I'm happy to share one with you uh, or to send one to you, I should say. I want to turn off my virtual background. Um, or two or three. Um, and if you're able to make a donation to offset costs for purchase and mailing, that would be most appreciated. Um, no requirement, of course, it is a donation. Uh, happy to send you other collateral material to help you out in the field, including a tree ID guide, um, or you can print it at home if, if you have a color printer, and also our um, field step-by-step um, -step guide. Um, one more thing that's really exciting, and I'll tell it to you guys, but it's not happening yet, is we had a group of students at Northeastern develop for us another app that is gonna help us track blocks. So Gina, you won't have to go into that Google Drive anymore. Um, we're hoping that that's gonna come out in the next week or two. It's really, really slick. Um, it allows you to reserve a block. And then when you're done, you just kick, hit complete. And, and that way we're keeping track of blocks. Um, and it's gonna be on your phone. It's gonna be a separate app from OpenTreeMap, um, but it's gonna be dynamic in the sense that things will be updated in real time um, once you know you'll have control and be able to see which blocks are available or not um, so we're really grateful for the group of undergrads at northeastern who who uh, approached us and did this project so meanwhile we're still going to be doing things the old-fashioned way um, i know michael um, will share that with you and and we're looking for gina and i think bill maybe whoever's in east boston sort of the team captain in east boston to help track those blocks that um, we're gonna be going back to. So thank you for all your work over the past couple of months. You guys have done amazing work collecting really invaluable information on empty planting sites. There are a whole bunch of purple dots in East Boston and Charlestown. And now we need to go back and look at all the green dots. So um, just, just here to thank you all and answer any questions you may have before I bow out and cook my family some dinner. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Hi. All right. So nice to see you all. Um, you, I think, should have my email. If you want to reach out, you have Michael's email. Thank you for making time tonight. Go easy on Michael, but ask him lots of tough questions. Um, and I really appreciate everything you've done so far, and, and I look forward to letting you know going outside with you all virtually and and having you all learn and, and really see see the streets in a different way. It's a really rewarding experience. So be well. All right. Thank you, David. Thank um, you, Michael. Have fun. Yep. All right, everyone. So I'm going to pull up the presentation I have prepared. Um, one second. All right, so I should be in a screen sharing setting right now. Can you guys all see it? Yeah. All right, great. All right, so once again, I'm Michael. I'm an intern at Speak for the Trees. Uh, I started back in September and I worked there until December, went back to school, finished my degree, and I'm back for the summer. Um, today, uh, we have a few goals of this training that we'll talk about. Uh, so we're gonna be mostly focusing on identifying trees today and the locations in which they're planted. We're gonna connect with each other and the communities that we live in. And all of this will help us gather information about the trees that are in our community. All right, so Right now we had our introductions from David um, and we're gonna start our process by moving on to learning about planting sites and using OpenTreeMap to do that. 
So uh, Boston's urban forest is quite large and extensive. You can see on this map where the green dots and green is. Uh, let's see. Do um, you can now see a red dot and you can see here is Boston Common and Public Gardens, but also in this area here where I'm circling is uh, the Beacon Hill area. And you can see that there's lots of green there. And you might be thinking there's lots of housing and shops and things like that. And all the green there are the street trees. So as you can see, there's lots of green throughout where you don't typically think of parks. And that's because the street trees are there and you can see they make up a really large part of the urban forest. Um, so we all kind of know that trees have different benefits and they all kind of come in different shapes and forms. Um, some of them can be environmental, like cooling the air, providing oxygen. Some can be health by promoting outdoor activities, reducing stress. And when we look at these benefits, uh, we can see that some of them we can quantify in numbers and in dollar values. So for instance, we have a tree here, it is a Norway maple, and we can see some of the environmental benefits that it provides to us. So there's things like it stores carbon, conserves energy, uh, removes carbon dioxide, improves the air, and filters stormwater. These numbers are calculated through iTree technology, which is part of the Open Tree Map app that we'll be using. Uh, so urban trees uh, have a lot of challenges that they face that one that might be growing in a backyard or in a forest might not face. So one of the things that we look at is uh, we look at these different uh, stressors that the trees face and we want to see if we can see any of them uh, and if any of these have effects on the trees and we do that in some indirect ways. So we are doing a complete street tree inventory. So we have to look at what they are, or what a complete street tree inventory is. So a complete is all of the trees, not just some. And then the street trees are the ones that are in the public right of way on the street. So right now we have some, we can look at our work that we've done so far. And this is the website version of Open Tree Map, which we will zoom in. As you can see, there are green dots and purple dots throughout Boston. The green dots represent where street trees are. The purple dots represent an opportunity where a tree can be placed. So I know that there's some work that's been done in Charlestown and East Boston and the groups there have done an excellent job of finding all of the empty planting sites. So you can see all these purple dots. And later on this summer, we're hoping to see a lot more green dots in these neighborhoods. Okay. So when we're inventorying, we have to inventory all the trees and empty planting sites in the right of way. So this includes a few different things, uh, the trees and the sidewalk, ones that are in medians or traffic triangles. Um, and sometimes the trees in the public right of way are not in the sidewalk, but instead right on the edge of the sidewalk. And later on, we're gonna be talking about how to inventory some of the blocks and um, the maps that you'll be getting to do this. Any questions so far? All right. Okay. So here is a question. You can look at this picture here of the trees. You can see there's one on, there's a few on the left side and a few on the right. Uh, if you Look, the one on the right side is a street tree, while the one on the left is not a street tree. 
So the one on the right with the check mark is one that's cared for and planted by the city of Boston, while the one on the left is one that's probably uh, cared for and planted by the building that you can see right next to it. So we are looking for a few pieces of information for our tree inventory. Uh, the first is the location of the site. Um, you'll use uh, the GPS on your phone to help you find where the trees are. You'll also be gathering some information on the planting site. And if there is a tree in the planting site, you will gather some data on it. And this will include the species, the size of the tree, an assessment of the tree, and anything that's around the tree. So to do this, you'll need a few things. First, you will need to have a smartphone with the Open Tree Map app downloaded on it already. You'll need some measuring tape, the tree ID handout, the inventory procedure handout, and an area with a map that's um, a map of an assigned area that is given to you. Uh, so we'll first start by talking about adding a planting site. So when you are out on a block, you're gonna start looking around for some clues that might indicate that there's a tree there, whether or not there actually is a tree. So those are called planting sites. And you'll first start on a block and you'll open up the Open Tree Map app and you'll start walking around and you'll come across a tree planting site there. Then you'll, you'll be in the app and you'll look at the map view in the hybrid. So the hybrid view will have both uh, a satellite picture and the markings on the street already on it. And then once you find a empty planting site, you're going to hit the add button. It looks slightly different on Androids and iPhones. As you can see, the Android has a plus symbol and the iPhone has an ad. You'll click the button and it'll bring you, um, it'll let, allow you to add a tree. For Androids, um, you tap on the screen and a blue marker will appear. On iPhones, a green marker will appear with a ring around it. You want to tap the approximate location of the tree on the map. Make sure that you put the tree on the sidewalk, not in the middle of the street. And sometimes it's a little hard to pinpoint it exactly. So if you need to move the marker, you will hold down it and drag to its appropriate spot. You can sometimes see a tree on the map, so that might help you figure out exactly where the tree is. Once you are done, you will click next. The location of the tree is one of the most important parts of our tree inventory data. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're putting it in the right position. I heard one trick for putting in the right position is to think about it like you're getting an Uber or a Lyft when you're thinking about the sidewalk, is you wanna make sure that they pick you up on the right spot. So just like that, you wanna make sure that you're putting the pin or the dot on the right spot on the sidewalk. Once you hit next, you will be brought to this screen here. You'll see a smaller map at the top of the location where you just put the tree, and you'll be asked to input some data about the tree. So this is step two. Is there anything, any questions about entering the location on Open Tree Map yet? Nope, okay. So here is, once again, the screen that you'll use for entering in information about the planting site. So you might be asking what a planting site may look like, and there are three different types. The first is the most common, and it's a single pit. 
a pit will have only one tree in it, and you'll find these throughout most of Boston. The second type is a continuous or a lawn. These are long strips that are planting sites, and they have two or more trees in them. And the last is the planter. Planters can be picked up and moved to another location so that tree is technically mobile. And if they don't want it there, they can move it to another spot at a later time or protect it during winter. We are looking for all three of these different types, but for the most part, you'll only have to worry about tree pits. So the first uh, bit of information you'll add to Open Tree Map is about the type of pit or the type of planting site that you have. So once you enter that in, it's now time to evaluate the sidewalk. So when we look at the sidewalk, we have to evaluate its width. And that is the distance perpendicular to the direction that the street is going. So when we measure the sidewalk, we measure it from the curb to the building or the edge of the sidewalk. We don't include the curb itself in the measurement. We then will click the drop down menu and we will see that there's three options for sidewalk width. The first is if it is less than six feet, if it's between six feet and eight feet, or if it's eight feet or greater. Once you look at your measurements, you'll click one of these options and we will move on to the next step, which is going to be about the planting site size. So this is what we do for every site along with the sidewalk. Uh, so for the planting site width, it is just like measuring the width of the sidewalk, except it's just for the planting site. So that's from the curb to the edge of the planting site. And you're gonna do this for every type of planting site and round it to the nearest inch. For tree pits, we ask for a second measurement and that is the length of the tree pit. And this is the measurement that would be parallel to the street. Once again, you wanna round that to the nearest inch and that's the inside of the tree pit that's getting measured. Here is a quick diagram of everything, of the measurements that we have to take. So we have the sidewalk width, we have the planting site width, and we have the planting site length if it's for a pit only. Any questions about the measurements for the sidewalk, planting site, or any of those? Okay. So once you are done doing your measurements, it's time to look at what's in the tree pit, the lawn or the planter. And there's a few types of materials that you can find. Plain dirt is uh, the most common. You can also find mulch, which is shredded up wood. Uh, there is some, you can have grass in there, rubber mats, which are allow people to walk over the tree pit without damaging the roots. Um, they allow water to get down into, uh, down below into the soil so that the tree can get the water it needs. Uh, sometimes there's concrete or asphalt, which is actually really bad for the tree. There can be bricks or pavers, and there can be gravel or small stones. So you're gonna select one of these by the, by the drop-down menu when you are in the app. And then there's gonna be some questions about the planting site that you'll need to answer. So you'll see if there's a fence or perimeter guard or a raised bed. A raised bed does not mean that it is a perimeter guard even though it is elevating up. These two are separate and sometimes can get confused. So a fence or perimeter guard doesn't have soil that's above the level of the sidewalk, where a raised bed does have soil above the sidewalk height. Uh, we also look to see if there's loose trash. If there is a lot of trash, make note of that. If not, 
Um, if there's just a few pieces, we don't consider that to be a lot of loose trash, so you don't need to mark that as an option. Uh, some trees or planting sites have a metal grate that goes around the tree. And we also look to see if there's any overhead wires. And then the last questions that you'll be asked are about what's in the planting site. So sometimes a tree can be removed and they leave just a stump. Other times the site can be empty with nothing in it, but there's a space for a tree to grow. Or sometimes there is a tree. So I'm going to share my screen on my phone and I'll sh run through the process of um, adding the information about a planting site. So let me just get this set up. All right. Do you see an iPhone on your screen? Okay. So I'm going to go to the Open Tree app, and here is my screen. So you can see here is Boston and the places that have been marked already. So we're going to add a tree or a planting site that doesn't actually exist. It's just going to be an example. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go pick a random area in South Boston, and we'll say. Here we are. So you'll tap hybrid, which is here at the top. And you can now see that you can see the buildings and you can see the streets as well. You will then hit the add button, which is right up here. I don't know. Run away. Uh, sorry about that. Um, anyway, you'll click the add button and then all you have to do is tap on the screen. So I'm going to tap right here. You can see I've placed it kind of over where I think a tree is. I can zoom in even further by clicking, dragging with my fingers. And you can see we're in this neighborhood right here. To move the tree or the marker, I'm just going to hold with my finger and drag it across my screen put it right where that tree is. Once I'm done, at the top of my screen, I'm going to hit next. So what we need to focus on first is about the planting site information. So this will be a little bit of a review, but just seeing it in the form that is in the app. So for planting site type, I just tap the option and it'll give me these three. I'm going to say that this one is a pit. So I tap pit and I hit done. For the sidewalk width, um, this is going to just say be a pretty typical sidewalk and be between six and eight feet. So all I have to do is select that and hit done. Uh, then we can move on to the planting site width. I measured this in advance. And I'm going to say that the width of the planting site is going to be 36 inches. So all I have to do is tap the box and type in the number. Then, because this is a tree pit, I'm going to add in the pit length. So I'm going to say that this one is 72 inches long. Then, all I have to do is tap material in site, and it'll give me the options that I talked about earlier. Uh, in this planting site, we're going to say that there is some plain dirt in it. So I'm done with that. I tap done. I'll then say, is there a raised bed? And we'll say no. Is there a fence or perimeter guard? No. Who's trash? No. Metal grate? We'll say yes. There are no wires overhead. And then is there a stump? And then this will provide us with 
our options. So if there's a stump, you can select yes, there is a stump. If there isn't a stump, you can say no, the site is empty. And if there isn't, if there's an actual tree, you select there is a tree. For stump and empty sites, that's all the information that you have to add. But for this example, we're going to say that there is a tree in it. So you will select there is a tree and done. Okay, I'm going to go back to sharing the PowerPoint. All right, here we are. Okay. So we have our two options, or once again, our three options, stump, empty site, and tree. For stump and empty site, you just hit done and save, and you are all set for this. And if there is a tree, we will move on. So now it's time to add a tree. And adding a tree is the fun part of the inventory process, and it has a few more steps than the planting site. I know this is new to most of you, um, so I'll go in a little bit more detail with this. So the first part is taking a picture of the tree. To do this, you want to stand at the edge of the sidewalk near the building or if there's grass or a lawn in front of it. And stand as far back as you can. You don't want to be in the street because that would be dangerous and we don't want you getting hurt. Instead, you're going to stand as far away on the edge of the sidewalk as you can. For iPhones, you'll go to the top and select tree picture and under tree picture, you'll do tree details and select camera and take a picture. For Android, there's a camera button at the top. So once you have the camera, you'll stand at the edge of the sidewalk and you'll try to take a picture as, with as much of the tree in it as you can, but also getting some clear things in the background. You'll take one picture of the tree. So here's an example of a tree that uh, we took a picture of in our inventory. As you can see, you can see the base of the tree, and as it's growing up, you can see it as well. In the background, you can see that there's this house which will act kind of as a uh, landmark so that if someone needs to check to make sure that that tree is there and check the information you input, they can easily find the tree based on what's in the background and the tree itself. Michael, I have a question about the photo. Um, if you're standing as far back as you can and you can't capture the entire tree in a regular portrait style photo, could you do panorama or no? Uh, we, if you can't get the entire tree, that's totally fine. We like to get okay. kind of as much as you can in there, just so that we can look at the, make sure that we have the right tree. But okay. if you can't get it fully in there, uh, right, just get as much as you can. And okay, thanks. If you and will look like, at some. Sorry, Michael, just another question. So do you err more towards, I'm thinking of trees that have been in our neighborhood for like 30, 35 years, so they're huge. Do you err more towards the trunk? You know, do you kind of get the middle? Or, you know, you're, in some cases, if I took a picture of a tree in a neighborhood, I'd get, you know, six feet of the trunk and I wouldn't be able to see any of the leaves. Yes. Uh, for large trees like that, you'll want to get mostly just the trunk and something very notable in the background. So if there's a street number on a building, try to get something like that. Sure. Any other questions about taking a picture of a tree? So Michael, so I'm assuming that it's only one picture is allowed. Yes, we only need one. Okay. Anything else? All right. And then oh, uh, the next thing we look at is if the tree is alive or not. So, there, so there's two options for this. You can say that the tree is alive or it's dead but standing. Uh, this is something that you can only really do in 
late spring to early fall because a lot of the trees will have their leaves on it so you can tell. It's harder to do in winter or in other cooler months. So we recommend only selecting if it's alive, if you know for a fact that it's alive. If you can't tell because it's uh, December, January, February, you can leave this part blank and we can go back to it later and add if it's alive or not. So uh, yep, there's two options, dead or alive. Now comes probably one of the trickiest parts, and that is identifying the tree itself. And the way that we do tree identification is by the leaves. So we'll take a look at some basic leaf anatomy. There are three parts that you would want to pay attention to. There's the tip, which is the end of the leaf. There's the margin, which is the edge. And there's the petiole which is, uh, you can think of as kind of like a stem that attaches the leaf itself to a twig. Um, so those are the three things that we typically look at when we are identifying trees. So we wanna keep these three in mind. All right, so we have, uh, there's two main types of leaf, leaves. There's the broad leaves, and then there's the ones that are needle-like. In Boston, they typically only plant broadleaf trees as street trees. It's very rare to find a needle-like tree as a street tree in Boston. I think we've found one so far in all of Boston in our inventory work so far. So we aren't gonna cover how to identify needle-like trees. Instead, we're just gonna focus on the broadleaf trees. So the first thing that we look at when identifying trees based on their leaves is the shape of the margin. And trees can come in two different categories of shapes. There's lobed and unlobed. So a lobed leaf will have uh, parts of it that kind of stick out. So as you can see, there's this leaf here, and this part juts out. This juts out, and, as, and there's multiple parts on it that jut out like this. Same on this leaf and on this leaf here. There's these big sections that stick out from the middle of the tree, or the leaf. And then there's unlobed leaves, which are more of a rounder shape and don't have these kind of parts that protrude out and come back in. So these are the two types of broadleaves that you'll come across. Any questions between what an unlobed leaf is versus a lobed leaf? Right. And then the different shape, or the different lobes and unlobes come in different shapes as well. So for the lobed leaf, we have two Types. We have the hand shape and then the oak shape. The hand, I think, looks kind of like a star, and those are typically maples or poplar, uh, the tulip poplar. Uh, the oak shape uh, is mostly oak types of trees, so you can think of the northern red oak, the pin oak, or the white oak. Unlobed leaves come in a few more different shapes. There's uneven. Uneven leaves are, have a margin that has a larger part on one side of the petiole than the other. So if you look at, so if you look here at this diagram, this part of the margin here is a little bit lower than the part over here where it meets the petiole. So it's not a perfect shape. A teardrop shaped leaf is shaped kind of like how you'd picture a teardrop with a petiole here at the bottom and then the point of the teardrop at the top. There's also the football shape, which starts out narrow, gets wider, and then narrows back down when it meets the tip. Uh, and then you can also come across what's called a compound leaf, which has a 
long kind of petiole with multiple little leaflets coming off of it. So here are the lobed leaves and the unlobed leaves. Um, after you look at that, you're going to look at where the petiole meets the twig. And there's two options for this. There's alternate and opposite. So as you can see here on this picture, the top is an opposite arrangement of leaves and the bottom is an alternate. Opposite leaves will have uh, uh, so here's an, sorry about that. Uh, there's alternate and opposite. Uh, alternate will be leaves every other um, on the twig. So one on one side, one on the other. And then you'll see, as you can see here, there's only one leaf on one side of the twig. And then opposite will be in pairs. Um, any questions so far about this, opposite or alternate? All right. And then the next and third step that you have is if it is a simple or a compound leaf. Uh, simple leaves have one kind of leaf at the end of a petiole, where a compound leaf will have multiple little leaflets off of the different petioles and mid groups. Um, compound leaves can look as if that there's multiple small leaves on one, but in fall you'll notice that the entire piece here will fall off. So So this here is one entire leaf. This will all fall off in fall time. And um, here is on the simple side, this is just the one leaf in the petiole here, which will also fall off. Uh, it can be a little tricky because you might think that these are little leaves, but they're not. Any questions about this it can get a little tricky. All right. So there's a bunch of different types of simple shaped leaves and compound leaves. Um, for the most part, you'll see um, for you'll see a lot of simple leaves and compound leaves. For compound leaves in Boston, you'll mostly see them as pinnately compound, which would be the leaflets are arranged in a line. They're sometimes doubly compound, which are multiple pinnately arranged leaflets off of one large stem. So here are the three things you are going to be looking for when you're identifying a tree. And as a review, it is lobed versus unlobed alternate versus opposite, and simple or compound. Any questions on these three steps? Okay. With those in mind, you will now, you can now look at the tree ID guide. Um, this is a two page guide that Speak Through the Trees has. It's available on our website. Um, and it has the 25 most common street trees in Boston. These make up about 90% of all of the trees in the city. So there's a good chance when you're out inventorying, you'll find at least one of them. Uh, and each of the, uh, the guide here is kind of broken up into a few different categories based off of what we talked about earlier. So you'll see that on the one, on the, let me just highlight something. So the leaves on this side are on one page. 
and these are all of the lobed leaves. So these are the ones that have the indents kind of in the leaf. And on the back side are the unlobed leaves and the compound leaves. So we'll kind of take a little bit, another closer look at these in a, in a bit. Um, when you're looking at the guide, there's information about the name of the tree, the species name, the, or the one that the scientists use, uh, a picture of the leaf, a picture of its seed, some description of the tree or the leaf. You'll see that there is the size of the leaves that they come in and that the arrangement of the leaves that they are in. So these are a lot of leaves and um, can get a little overwhelming. So it will take some practice for you to learn to identify the different leaves that they have. So there are 10 trees that actually make up 85% of all the trees. The ones that we already saw, the whole list was about 90. So you can just see that Boston really has a thing for these 10 trees. So we have ones that are simple and unlobed. We have ones that are simple and lobed. And we have compound leaves, which are also technically unlobed. So we're going to take uh, some time now to focus in on some of these trees that are in Boston that are the top 10. So one kind that you might come across is the little leaf linden. This has that uneven shape. It also can look like a heart. Um, this tree, some people think, has two different types of leaves, but they are um, actually the main leaf, the real leaves look like the heart, while the um, ones that people think are the second type of the leaves are actually part of the seed, kind of like uh, they're called samaras, I believe, and they kind of act kind of like a helicopter to let the seeds kind of travel away. These can be quite large and the fruit will be green in the summer and then turn kind of a brown color in fall. Um, another one that looks similar is the calorie pear. Um, it also produces a brown fruit, but the shape of the leaves are teardropped and they kind of have a waxy texture to them. One thing you can see with the calorie pears is that the leaves kind of have a wavy kind of look to them, how the margin kind of goes up and down, but it's not, it's still a, un, a unlobed leaf. Uh, the Zelkova is another type of leaf that, or type of tree that you'll find. In Boston, they plant the Japanese Zelkova and these have kind of a long teardrop shape leaf. You can notice um, a Zelkova pretty easily because of its bark and its uh, pattern in which the branches grow. So the bark itself is kind of flaky and it will reveal underneath it an orange color. And then the branches all tend to start at about six feet up the tree and they will branch rapidly. In the picture below, you can kind of see some of the branches that are coming off. There's quite a lot in that kind of small area, so that's one of the defining features of the Japanese alcova. Another type of tree that has a teardrop shape is the cherry. Uh, you can see that the cherry has kind of a very comes to a very fine point at the top. You can also tell if a tree is a cherry tree because if you look at the petiole you'll find some nectar glands at the base which look like little two little bumps. Um, there's not a picture of it here but there is a picture of it on the tree ID guide so you can take a look back at that a little bit later. Cherry trees also have very distinctive barking because they have these horizontal stripes around them instead of a lot of trees which have kind of vertical ones, these grow kind of horizontal. And uh, some of the cherry trees will produce some fruit um, and they will all have kind of these beautiful white to pink flowers. 
Uh, we also have the red maple versus the Norway maple. Uh, red maples kind of have these three uh, distinctive tip, tips to them. Um, and you'll, you can look at them and you'll think that they are strangely named red maple because, of, because their leaves are green. I believe that they're called red maples because of the color of their petioles, which are often red. Um, the red maple can easily be uh, cultivated in, by people and breeded to have kind of different characteristics. So some can be very red in color in fall, where some can be um, kind of like a more oval shape when it grows. So red maples can look a little bit different, but they all kind of have this three point or three tip look to them. The Norway maple on the right is one of the most common trees in Boston. You can tell it's a Norway maple by breaking off one of the leaves of the petiole. And if you see a white kind of milky substance, the, you can say that that is a Norway maple because other maples won't have that milky substance. The bark is also very, uh, is a strong characteristic because it's very kind of scaly, rigid, and kind of has this kind of cross-hatched pattern. Uh, uh, let's see, we also have the London plane tree, which is another hand-shaped leaf. It also has a very unique bark where I think it looks kind of like a camouflage look where it has these different patches that are different colors. It is a hybrid of two different types of sycamore trees. It was very, it grew very well in uh, Europe, in London, and because of its success as a street tree there, it soon made its way to a lot of other cities in Europe and then over to the U.S. Uh, it looks similar to a maple, but you can tell the difference because the maples earlier had opposite arrangements, where these have an alternate arrangement. Um, the northern red oak is an oak-shaped leaf. Uh, it produces kind of these lobed leaves that have points at the end. Um, and it also produces an acorn. There are some other types of oaks that they do plant in Boston, a swamp white oak and a pin oak. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between a northern red oak and a pin oak because they both come to a point at the end, but pin oaks have these very deep cuts within the sides of them, where northern red oaks have shallower ones. Um, all three of these oak trees here will produce an acorn as their seed. And uh, a little bit about the swamp white oak is that instead of coming to a point, it has a very rounded margin. We have also the honey locust, which I think is now the most common tree that we've inventoried. This is a compound leaf. Um, it turns a very very like golden color in fall, kind of like a honey color, which gives it its name, the honey locust. Um, it does really well in cities and it produces these long bean pods in summer, which will turn brown in fall and you'll see them fall to the ground. I think if you pick them up and shake it, it'll sound kind of like a maraca. And then we also have the ash tree, which is another compound but this one has very large leaves to it and it has a different shaped seed, kind of ones that look similar to um, maples because they have a samara, I believe, as kind of like a way to help the seeds disperse. Um, okay. I have some samples of some leaves that we can look at from my backyard. So I don't live in Boston, so, uh, and there's a lots of woods around my house. So I was able to look this afternoon and find some samples to share so we can kind of talk about them in more detail. So the first is 
I have here is a Norway maple. I don't know if you, how well you can see this. Here's one of the leaves. It is the hand shape. Um, you can see it's very green. And when I break off a leaf, it will be producing kind of like a milky substance at the end, which I don't know how well you can see that because it's small. Um, and I also have another sample of the Norway maple. So this kind has a different color compared to this one. It's harder to tell in the sliding, but the one I'm holding right here, if you're looking from a distance, has a very red color to it. It's called the Crimson King. It's a different cultivar of the Norway maple. So just like people kind of come in all color, shapes, and sizes, the Norway maple is like that because the leaves here are quite green and then this one will look quite red in the sun. So Norway maples are tricky, but the one way to tell is by breaking off a leaf and seeing kind of the milky substance that will form where you break it. Uh, the next thing I have is a silver maple. So these have very pointed low, uh, margins and very deep lobes here. On the back side, it looks silver in the light. That's how it got its name. Uh, let's see. Here is a northern red oak. You can see it has the points to it and the lobes aren't very deep. Uh, and then compared to this, which is a pin oak, you can see that the lobes here are very fine and there's these deep cuts in them. And then there's also the, I have, I don't have the swamp white oak, but I have a regular white oak. So it has these, it has the oak shape with these kind of finger-like pieces on them that come out. And they're rounded at the margin and So this crazy one is a black locust. It looks similar to a honey locust. I don't have a honey locust around here, so this is as good as I could get. This piece here is the entire leaf itself. You can see there's many little leaflets on it. And um, yeah, and it's, I think it's an interesting kind of tree. So this is the black locust, not the honey locust. And then right here, I have the elm tree, or this is an American elm. Um, you can, a lot of elms have this uneven shape with these kind of serrated margins around it, and they have a very rough texture to them. Um, yeah, a lot, of them, a lot of trees might be smooth, but the elm is known for being very rough to the touch. And the last type of tree or, that I could find is a red maple. And as you can see, like many other red maples, it has the three points at the top that are very defined. Do I have any questions about how to identify different types of trees or any questions about trees that I've talked about so far? Michael, I have a question on whether something is alive or standing dead. What if they're in between? What if they're clearly sick, half dead, you know? <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit. So it has to be either fully alive or looks it's either alive or kind of meh. There are zombies out there. <laughs> yeah. There are some trees that look 
like okay. yelling, but they'll be alive. We'll get to that stuff in a little bit. Michael, I had a question about tree identification. I think in one of your emails, you had said that there were a couple of apps that you could actually have in your phone to help to identify the trees. Is that correct? There are, yes. There's iNaturalist, which is, I believe, open source. So anyone can contribute to that or use the information without paying. They have some ID guides for trees that are found in Massachusetts. Not all of the trees that are planted as street trees are native to the city or Massachusetts itself, like for instance, the Japanese alcoba. So there won't be guides on how to identify that, but that can be one app you can use. There's also LeafSnap, mm -hmm. which allows you to take a picture and then it will identify the tree based off of the picture you submit. And the last is you can use the Arbor Day website and use their What Tree Is This service. It's mm -hmm. mostly for trees that are naturally growing in the Northeast, but you might be able to find some that are non-native to the area. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the tree, we recommend doing, giving it your best guess and mm -hmm putting in a tree that you think it is. We'll get to this level of certainty in a little bit. Okay. Michael, I have a, I don't know if you can see it. I think it's a red maple, but it seems really spikier than the ones you showed. Okay. Uh, anyway, I don't want to put you on the spot, but there you go. Well, I am not an arborist or a okay. botanist. My background is actually in planning and sustainability. So mm -hmm. I'm not the best. It might, it's probably a maple and it might be a cultivar of the red maple. Okay. It's certainly guess. a maple. No, no mm -hmm. doubt it's a maple. Um, so if I, it, it's an actual street tree on my street. So mm -hmm. I'd probably just put it down as red maple and yes. put a question mark. Okay. Yes. I have, I have a couple of those in my neighborhood. I'm pretty sure it's Amor maple. An Amor maple. A-M-U-R. A-M-U-R. I'm so glad, Pamela. I will look it up. Yeah, it's a great tree. Yeah. Um, and uh, Michael, another app you could take a look at is called Plant Snap. Okay. I've used that for a bunch of plants, not particularly trees, but it's pretty good and it's free. Okay. Plant Snap. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, any other questions? All right, if you have any others, let me know and we can, I'm happy to answer them. Now I need to. 100%, it's an amber maple, Pamela. Yeah, I thought so. You're brilliant. You're Good brilliant. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will share my screen again and we can continue on with the training. Super good street tree. Okay, so once you've identified the tree that you have, it's now time to enter that species onto open tree map. So you're gonna get a bunch of things kind of, um, so you're gonna tap on set species and you're going to select the species that there that you think you've identified. So um, to do that you can either scroll through the entire list and find the one that you have or you can type at the or you can search at the top and select the one that you have or that you think you have. Uh, for some trees it's hard to tell exactly what species it is so we recommend if you don't know the species you can also put in the genus of the species. So that could be something like an oak, maple, could be an elm or a cherry, something like that, which is like the category you can think of, of the type of tree. Um, we would prefer if you would put in the species, even if it is kind of a wild guess. If you don't know, I think a, putting it in as a guess is better than leaving it blank. 
And then you have to kind of evaluate how certain you are about the type of tree that you have. So we have three different options. So we have very confident, somewhat confident, and not sure at all. So we prefer if all of yours could be very confident, but we know that that's not always realistic. So for some of the very common street trees, like the honey locust or the Norway maple, you might put in as very confident because you're like, yes, I know that's exactly a Norway maple or a honey locust. If you're looking at one and you're not exactly sure what it is, but you think it might be one, you can put in somewhat confident and that's um, fine. And if you're not sure at all and you just put in a species you think it looks most like, you can put not sure at all. So then once you uh, find the species and you select how confident you are in it, it's time to now measure the tree at, um, to see how big it is. To do this, we measure at a very specific point on the tree called diameter at breast point. This is 54 inches up the tree, starting at the base where it meets the ground and moving up. Um, you can see here we have a volunteer measuring this tree at 54 inches up the tree. So, um, as you can see, this picture here also demonstrates measuring 54 inches up the tree. So to do that, you have your measuring tape and you can measure from the ground up. You can use either a flexible one that you can use for say sewing, or you can use kind of more of a rigid one to measure 54 inches up. To make this go faster, you can also uh, note where 54 inches on your body. I had one volunteer put a piece of tape on her shirt, I had one put a sticker, and that kind of shows you can stand next to the tree and kind of put your finger there to say this is where 54 inches is. So there's multiple ways to do it. Um, you'd be most precise if you do it measuring every time, but we know that for efficiency, putting a sticker or knowing where 54 inches is on your body can be more efficient. And then to measure the tree, we do the circumference of it. So you'll wrap a flexible measuring tape around the tree, measure their circumference, and then you put that into the app, which will convert it to the diameter. Uh, so you want to measure the circumference, which is the distance around, not the diameter, unless you have a very expensive tool to measure the diameter of a tree, which I don't think anyone does. So we say measure the circumference. And if we go back, we want to make sure that this is to the nearest half inch on uh, the tree or when you do your measurements. So to get between the circumference and diameter, the app will divide it by pi. Sometimes measuring at DBH is not always uh, simple because nature and the landscape is always kind of diverse. So uh, if it's level, you just measure normally up 54 inches. If the tree is on a slope, you're gonna to go to the highest point of the slope where it meets the tree and measure 54 inches up. So uh, it might look higher than 54 inches from the lower end of the slope, but we are more concerned about where it is at the highest, uh, measuring from the highest point of the slope where it meets the tree up. If the tree is leaning, you want to measure 54 inches in the direction of the lean and then measure the tree perpendicular to the way it's growing. So typically, if it's on level ground or on a slope, you'll measure kind of what would be level, but if it's a leaning tree, you measure it to that angle or perpendicular to the angle it's growing. For trees that have two main stems, which are growing vertically, you would measure below the, um, where the two stems break off. Or if it has a deformity at 54 inches, you'll measure actually above. 
So multi-stem you measure below, deformity you measure above. Any questions so far on measuring a tree? Okay. Um, and here's just kind of a picture demonstration of, of other people doing some measuring of a tree. So the one on the left is a typical situation where the one on the right is a multi-stem. So you can see that there's multiple branches coming off of it. And uh, you'd measure below where all the branching starts. These are some deformities that there might be, some scarring from where other branches have grown and got cut off or fallen off. So you wanna measure above those. Uh, and here's just some of the tips that we have for measuring at DBH. Um, remember that we measure this in inches to the nearest half inch. One problem that we do run into is that people will enter in the circumference of the tree where it says diameter, and it'll give us these massive trees. Um, you want to just be careful that you're entering in the part where it says circumference. Any questions before we move on? All right, let me know if you do. And here's just um, a picture from the app, which I'll go through later with you. Um, if the tree is multi-stem, you do need to select that it is a multi-stem tree. If it's not, you don't have to do this step. You can move on. Okay, so sometimes trees can um, have very good uh, coverage and sometimes uh, trees can be missing some of their leaves. Uh, so we have trees that are vigorous, which have 90% or more of their leaves. We also have trees that kind of have adequate coverage, and then we have trees that are sparse. So the trees that are sparse were the ones that we talked about earlier that look like they're about to die or not doing so well, clearly unhealthy. So these ones are considered alive, but they aren't you know, the best, or in the best condition right now. We would want all of our trees to have vigorous growth. And then there's the trees that have no leaves at all. These are, if they're in summer, they're most likely to be a dead tree. Um, okay, and then you'll next have to assess the amount of pruning that you have on the tree. We are really concerned if, or really only concerned if there is a lot of pruning on the tree. So. Here are some examples of trees that may have had some pruning to make them kind of healthier because some trees do need to be pruned. Um, these look quite well and you don't see much pruning at all. And then there's trees over here on the right that have had some extensive pruning. These trees, as you can see, don't really look like how a tree would grow in the wild. You would typically find this if there were wires going through the tree or above where the tree started growing. So if there is some pruning, because you can see that the trees on the uh, left have probably had some to keep them in that nice shape, that's fine. But the ones that, are ex that have had a lot of pruning, you want to make sure that you mark that they've been extensively pruned. Any questions before we move on? Right. So now you'll put on uh, some observation glasses and you'll look around the tree to see what you see, if there are any of these features. So we have sucker growth, which are uh, these growths that look like little stems branching off the bottom of a tree. This is a sign that the tree is distressed. We also can see some nat unnatural or discoloring of leaves. In fall, it's harder to tell when this is happening because the leaves often turn these vibrant colors. 
but if you're inventorying in summer and you see that some of the leaves are half green, half orange, or if you see that parts of the leaves are very dark and others are very light, make note of that. You can also see, tell us if you see that the tree is leaning. The way I typically say a tree is leaning is if you can walk around the tree pit and if you get hit by the tree or the trunk of the tree, and the tree is leaning. If you can walk around the pit and you don't hit the tree at all, I don't typically consider that leaning. Not every tree grows straight up. Some have a natural kind of bend to them. But if you see something that is kind of leaning over the street or could become a hazard to pedestrians, make note of that. Uh, then you can also look down and you can see if there is a metal grate, you have to see if it is constricting the growth. That would mean that the tree is kind of growing over the metal grate because it is no longer fitting in the hole that was cut out in the metal grate for it. Uh, this isn't healthy for the tree, so you want to make sure that if you see this, check it off in the app. Um, if there is any wounds in the tree, note that. These can often be caused by cars hitting trees and damaging the bark. Um, this can cause a tree to eventually die, and we just want to monitor to see if uh, there's any wounds that we should be aware of. And if there is any pooling of water in the pit. So some tree pits have poor drainage. So if you see a lot of water in it, that's not kind of going back down to the earth, make note of that. Um, for newly planted trees, there are often uh, stakes put in with wires to help the tree grow straight and um, establish its roots a little bit better so it's not wobbling in the wind. If you see stakes, um, this one is without wires. Mark that there is wooden stakes, but without wires. And sometimes there are some that have the cables or wires still attached to the tree. So if you see that, note that as well. Um, sometimes people tape flyers to trees and they'll leave the tape on. What we tell our volunteers is if you see tape around a tree, with a poster for an event that happened over a week ago, you can take the poster off the tree and the tape. Just be careful when removing the tape that you don't pull off the bark. So you don't want to cause another trunk wound with, on that tree. Lights are very bad for trees because it can constrict its growth. And um, I have actually a tree in my yard that the tree just grew over some of the wires because they were on there for too long. And now the wires are in the tree and we had to cut all the wires out. At, and that was just a mess. So that's not healthy for the tree. So you wanna make sure if you see lights kind of going wrapped around a tree that you mark that so that we can monitor to see if the tree will grow over the lights. Sometimes people will lock a bike to it. So if you see that, mark that. And Younger trees that are newly planted sometimes will have a watering bag put in it. Watering bags are used, um, you fill them up with water and it will slowly let water kind of trickle down to the soil. It's actually not the best for trees. It's better to water them daily when they're newly planted than to use a watering bag. But because there are a lot of young trees in the city, they sometimes will use a watering bag to uh, help water the tree when they can't get to it. If you see a watering bag, look inside. There's uh, sometimes water in it, and if you see water in it, you'll mark that the watering bag has water. If it's empty, you can mark that it's empty. I've seen these used multiple times as trash cans, so if you see that, you'll have to go back and mark that there's trash in the tree pit because they'll people put trash inside the bag. Any questions on these features? Okay. Um, and oh, it's not really a question. 
uh, in my neighborhood, we have a lot of tree guards. So it's not a fence. It's actually a, a, a very tall uh, metal round piece that goes around the whole trunk up to maybe, you know, five feet or so. Um, and there doesn't seem to be an option for marking that anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, I even ran across it in a lot of empty pits. So when I was doing those for the South End, you know, and they're standing there, but the tree is gone. Um, and I also have seen quite a few of them embedded in the bark, so it's kind of the same problem, but they embed higher up. Um, is, is there a way to get that added? At least I've been putting it in the notes when I run across it, but... Uh, yeah, so if you run across something like that, you can put it, we say put it in the notes. Mm -hmm. Those aren't as common of features that we've seen, so um, we might if you see it often a lot, we'll add it to one of the options. But for yeah. now, just put it in the notes. Yeah, it's um, very common in the south end and the back bay. You'll see them everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you see anything that's noteworthy on the tree that I haven't listed already, you can put it in the notes section. Mm -hmm. um, typically, volunteers don't leave notes because the trees are pretty typical. But if you see something that's you think is there to help the tree, or if you see something that might be hurting the tree, put that in the notes. Um, we have some things that we see often in the notes. Um, the first is insects. So if you see insects burrowing into the tree, you can just write that there's insects biting in or holes or in the leaves. If you mess up and can't undo something. Yeah, the on the floor for UCLA. Um, if you need to, uh, if you put something in that you can't undo, you can hit, you can type in delete and someone will go back and delete the tree that you put in. And if for some reason you need to stop uh, your tree inventorying mid tree, you can put incomplete in the notes to, as a note to you and a note to us that you need to go back and finish adding information about that tree. Big double layout. Okay. Um, and once you're done, you hit save or done. So I'm going to connect to my phone again and we will see the uh, how to use the app. Uh, let's see. All right, you should see my phone again. So we already have our tree that we have in here. We have our planting site information that we just put in. You can also see that we have the pin at the top. So then we now need to go down to tree information and add the information that we just looked at for the tree. So first we'll tap tree is, and then it'll give us the two options. So that the tree that we are inventorying right now is alive. So we're gonna mark that the tree is alive. Done. Next, we have to select our species. So we have many species here. You can look through the whole list, it's quite long but we're gonna pretend that this is a red maple. So you search red maple and it'll still be alphabetical, so you'll have to scroll and we'll see red maple right there. And we'll select it and then it'll bring us right back to where we are. So you'll see it's selected but when it says set species and then the species that you just put in. And because we are expert tree inventoriers, we're gonna say that we're very confident that this is a um, red maple. And we had to do our measurements at DBH. So we have the tree circumference. And this is going to be a smaller tree. So we're going to say that the circumference of this is 9.5 inches. So that will give us a diameter automatically at the top. Remember that we're putting it in the circumference, not the diameter. 
for multi-stem, our tree isn't multi-stem, so there's no option to select if it's, multi if it's not multi-stem. So we don't need to select anything, we can just hit done. Next, we'll move down to see the percent of tree that is green. And it'll give us our options. Our tree looks pretty good, but it has a few bare branches. So I'm gonna call this adequate, because I think there's about 80% of the branches that are covered with leaves. And then I hit done. For the pruning, there isn't much done to it yet. So I'm gonna say none to some. Uh, other features, we don't see many. We'll put down that there is a watering bag with water in it. And we can also scroll up and say that there is uh, some pooling of water in the tree pit. And once I'm done selecting those, I hit done. In the notes here, I'm gonna write delete because this isn't a real tree and it'll mark to one of the Speak for the Trees staff that we need to delete this. And then, I almost forgot, we need to take a tree picture. So you do, on um, iPhones, you'll click tree picture, and then you'll hit camera. And right now, I have some leaves here, and I'm just gonna take a picture of that. Remember that you wanna get something in the background because there's not a tree right in front of me. It's a little difficult. But remember, look for something like a utility pole, a street number, street sign, something like that. And once you're done, you'll hit use photo and it'll save it here. Before you go, uh, you wanna make sure that you review all your information and make sure that it is all accurate. I think we're all set. So what we're gonna do is hit done, and it'll notify me that it is saving. And you can now see that it has been added to the map. Um, there will be a green dot, and that'll signify that there is a tree there. If you don't have a tree and you save it, you'll see these purple dots here. Any questions on that? Um, okay, so we're running out of time. I'm just gonna show a few more things uh, quickly and then we will be all done for the day. Uh, uh, so sometimes you might come across a tree growing out of a stump. If the tree is taller than 54 inches, we mark it as a tree. And then you'll measure up 54 inches on the tree growing out of the stump and measure the DBH there. Uh, sometimes there'll be medians in the middle of traffic lanes or between a bike path. If the median is accessible, we'd like you to inventory those trees. If the median is not accessible, so like one that doesn't have a crosswalk leading to it or one that doesn't have a sidewalk, do not inventory those trees. Remember that your safety is a priority and we don't want you getting in the way of cars. Uh, for the continuous strips or longs, if you notice that there are trees spaced more than our trees need to be spaced 25 feet apart from each other. If there is more than 50 feet between two trees, you have to add an empty planting site in between the two. Um, so make sure that there is a tree at least every 25 feet from one another. Any questions on these three things, the stumps, medians, or continuous strips? Nope. Okay, uh, at Speak for the Trees, we inventory by blocks. Um, so each block is given a number, and as of right now, blocks are assigned by team leaders. So I'm gonna show you um, in the next slide how we enter in the block, or how to inventory a block, 
and some of the things that you might see when you are doing that. Uh, oh, here's just a close up of the blocks with their numbers. So here we are at block one, two, three, four. You can see that we are that purple star right there. I can, believe I can make it spin. Yep. So that's where we are. And now we have to inventory this block. So we're going to head up the block and measure and inventory the trees that we see. So we move up the block. We have those three trees and we have the green dots. Next, we're going to have to turn and go down the sidewalk. We don't cross the street because we're inventorying block one, two, three, four. So when you're inventorying, you don't cross the street, you stay on the same sidewalk. And you'll continue down the sidewalk, inventorying all the trees and empty planting sites that you might come across until you get back to your original spot that you're at. Once you've done all the trees and empty planting sites, that tree or that block is done. Sometimes streets might, or sometimes a block might have a little side street that goes into it. And uh, the protocol for that is similar to what you would do for a regular square block. So you'll inventory the trees and pits. And once you get here, and you'll, and you'll see there's this crosswalk, you're gonna continue on the sidewalk instead and go around that little side street because it's still part of that original block that you have. So you'll go up and around that little side street until you get back to the original. So all of those trees and uh, empty planting sites will be inventoried for that area. You don't want to cross the sidewalk or cross the crosswalk. You want to go down that little side street. And sometimes if you're looking at a map and of where you're assigned and you'll see a red line going down the center of a street. That means that street is not a publicly owned street, it's privately owned. So what you wanna do is avoid that and you'll actually, you don't wanna inventory those two and to delete this. So the two that are right here, you don't wanna inventory. I don't know, can you see my cursor? So, this and that you don't want to inventory because those oop, what happened here so these two here you don't want to inventory yep and then you'll end up back in your original spot because there's the red line here you don't inventory that street any questions on inventorying blocks or the protocol for that? Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, right now, the way that we inventory blocks uh, is done kind of, we manually assign blocks. So we have right now two team leaders, one from East Boston, I believe that's Bill, and we have Gina from Charlestown. Um, I believe most, if you are in East Boston, I think you should all have Bill's email because he probably invited you to it. And if you live in Charlestown, you should have Gina's informa uh, contact information so you can talk to either of them to get assigned blocks. If you're an individual right now doing the inventory process, email me and I will give you some blocks to do. Um, later on this year, hopefully around the beginning of July, we'll have an app that will, that you can automate or you can assign yourself blocks to do and mark them as complete as you do them. So more information on that will be coming soon. Um, Do I have any questions about this or the process? Michael, how does somebody who doesn't have the Open Tree Map get the app? Do you send it to them because they've gone through this training? Uh, if you don't have an Open Tree Map account, put your email in the chat um, and I will 
send you the information on how to create an account. I have a list, I believe, of everyone who's here. If you didn't register for the event and you just got the link from someone else, put your email down because I don't have your contact information and I can send you that, uh, how to create an account. If you have one already and have done the training for just empty planting sites, I will then give you permission to do adding trees. So I should have everyone's, if you haven't registered, just put your email in and I'll handle it. <laughs> great, great job, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Are you done? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Is that it? Cheerio. All right. That's all for me. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll stick around. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. everyone. We'll be in touch, Gina. Excellent. Bye, Trish. Bye. Thank you. Great job, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.